All right, so lately on Sunday nights, for the past, I don't know how many weeks it's been, we've been doing a series on where the Bible uses the words, take heed. And um, it was one thing, we, we started with some passages where the same concepts were being taught repeatedly and using the phrase, take heed or beware. And these are things that, we, that I felt that we ought to just take a special look at. And, and I started this series because if Jesus or if the Bible, if someone's saying, hey, take heed, pay attention to this, then it would make sense that we should be ta- paying attention to this as well. So that's what we're doing tonight. And um, I don't know how many more weeks we're going to go on. There's a, there's a few more subjects. I'm not sure if I'm going to hit them all or not. Um, but tonight we are looking at Matthew chapter 6. And uh, the words, of course, there in verse number one, the very first words are take heed. And what he's warning about in this chapter, take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your father, which is in heaven. So uh, the concept that's being taught here in taking heed is basically take a heed that you're doing things for the right reasons. There are things that you can do that are the right things to do that are good things to do, that are things that God wants you to do. But if you do them in the wrong way, it's not going to benefit you anything at all. What what actually just came to mind right now, I didn't have this in my notes, but 1 Corinthians 13 explains this perfectly. Because we can do a lot of good things if you just look at the physical actions that you do. But the Bible tells us and explains very clearly in in 1 Corinthians 13, that if you don't have charity, if your heart's not in it, if your heart's not right, it's not going to profit you anything. Now, we know as believers in Christ that we don't have to earn our way to heaven. Salvation's 100% bought and paid for. And because of that, God has promised us that he will reward us for the good works that we do on this life, that we can earn ourselves rewards in heaven. In fact, we just saw that in Matthew chapter 6. Where where, where the Bible, Jesus is explaining, hey, you know, look not on the things of this world. Let's, you know, set your hearts on the things that are above. Set your hearts on on, on heavenly rewards, on, on treasures in heaven where moth and rust doesn't corrupt but where your, your treasures and your riches are secure and are going to last forever. That's what we need to be focused on. But in so doing, we need to take heed in how we do those things. For, uh, we're going to look at Matthew 6. If you want to turn to 1 Corinthians 13, we'll see this really quickly. The Bible says, Though I speak with the, with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or, as tinkly, or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Look at verse number 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. You say, how does that profit you nothing? If you gave up everything that you had and you're like feeding the poor and you're, do, you know, you're helping people out and you gave your body to be burned and you're, you know, you're doing all this stuff, if, you're not, if you don't have your heart in it, if your heart's not right, he says it, it's basically meaningless. And that's what you know, charity is a special type of love where you are loving other people, and, and really the root word kind of comes from care, that charity comes from caring, and when you're esteeming others better than yourselves, you're having charity. When you're, when you're focused on other people's needs and not your own, then, then the act of giving of yourself and giving your money and doing all these other things, then that has value. But see, the Bill Gates of this world, or these other anthropologists, these people that have all these billions of dollars that really don't care about people because they are behind a lot of legislation. They're behind a lot of, you know, involved with with other organizations that are actually killing people, that are looking to um, destroy people's lives, and and they don't really care about people, but they put up a lot of money to these so-called charities to, to, to make themselves look good. And this is what the Bible's warning about in Matthew chapter 6. So we want to make sure we have the right hour. We want to take heed. First of all, the very first thing that we're going to take heed to, there's a few things mentioned in this one chapter in Matthew 6. We want to take heed that we don't do our alms before men to be seen of them. So what does that mean? Doing, giving alms. Now, people get a little bit confused about alms and tithes and, you know, givings and all these different things. 
Alms is literally when you would just give money to someone who needs it. Usually what we'll find in the Bible is people asking alms. So when people are, um, you know, disabled and they're not able to work, and the, you'll find them in various stories, especially in the book of Acts, where they're, they're sitting, you know, close to the gate of the temple or something like that because they're not able to work for themselves. So they're asking alms. They're asking charity. They're asking for, for some money and for some help to help them through. And these type of people, people who are not able to work, are the type of people that ought to be taken care of, that, 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 that it is legitimate and right to, to give money to, to help them out help these people out. But you know what you're not going to find in the Bible is giving your alms to people who are completely full-bodied, full-abled, and just are too lazy to go out and get themselves a job. Right. And you know what? It, it, sometimes it takes, a, it, it takes um, these events to happen. You know, one of my friends recently lost his job, and he's a very faithful person and a very, very good hard worker. And Guess what? He had another job within like a day. And then you hear all these people going, oh, I can't even find any work. I don't know. Where do you get work? And it's like, I don't know. I can't do anything. What am I supposed to do? Yet I have friends that just, I mean, overnight you're getting a job. Why? Because they have character. Why? Because it's not that hard to find work. If you, if you don't have a job, you, sh you better be able to get a job. It's like in this town, I don't care. You ought, you ought to be able to find a job and, and, and start working. And these bums that, that are completely well able to do work that just want to beg for money, that is not a, a, a righteous place to be giving alms. But I'm getting, I, I don't even want to get into that topic. I, uh, I'm allowing myself to get a little bit off on a rabbit trail when it comes to that. But almsgiving is basically just giving to people. If you were to give money to someone on the street, that would be giving alms. So just by definition, whether right or not, you're giving the person a little help, a little bit of money is giving alms to them, which is different than giving your tithe to God in the church. When you go and, and give 10% of your increase, that's a, a completely separate type of giving. Like almsgiving is, a free will, is like a free will offering. It's where... You want to go and be a blessing to somebody. And if you want to be a blessing to someone, because this is given to an individual. This is given to someone who's going to directly benefit from you giving them money. And what the Bible is teaching is that you don't give your alms before men. You don't want everybody to see, oh, yeah. You know, and, and not only not to see it, but then that means don't go brag about it. Don't go tell everyone how, you know, oh, I, I saw this guy when I came home from work and I gave him a hundred bucks and, you know, and tell everyone this story about how nice you were to this person that needed some help. They don't need to know that. And you know what? You can do that. You can choose to do that. But when you, when you just spread abroad the matter of how nice you are and, and how much alms you're giving, the Bible says you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. See, when you do the things from your heart, when you don't care what other people think, when you're willing to help someone out, you see someone in need and you want to be a blessing to them because they're down and out, because they need some help, because they're disabled, because whatever, and they need, they need a helping hand, and you reach in your pocket and you give that man some money, you know what? No one needs to know about that, but God sees that. And God loves to see that type of thing when you're taking care of people, when you're taking care of those that don't have anyone else to take care of them, that's right out of the heart of God. And you know what? God's going to bless you for that, and God will reward you for that. That's a good thing to do. But when you let everybody know about it, and you start getting the glory of man because you just want to make sure everyone knows how great of a person you are, no reward. That's it. God just says, okay, well, you have your reward. That, that is your reward. Getting people to think you're such a great person, that's your reward right there. And you know what? A lot of people, they want to buy that. That's why they have, you know, public relations firms. And they, you know, they, they have a certain amount of money because they can write it off on taxes and they want to, but then they, they blow the trumpet and make it sound like it's this, you know, oh, look at how much money we're giving. Why? Because they want people to like their company and buy their products and whatever and, and like them and, and have, you know, do business with them because they like them. And that's why they sound the trumpet. They have their reward. They're not getting anything special from doing that other than their, their um, per, uh, present time rewards. And we ought not to be caring about
the rewards that we can gain in this lifetime. We need to care about the rewards we're going to get in heaven because those have lasting value. I mean, if you get people to, to think, wow, what a great guy, that's going to be very short-lived. You might gain a little bit from that. I don't know. I mean, maybe someone will give you gifts because they see you being generous or something. I don't know. I mean, you, you might stand to gain physically from something in that world if you want to play that game of making sure everybody knows that you're giving money. But it's going to be nothing compared to if you just keep your mouth shut and you just do it because you care about something. You want to be a blessing of what God's going to have in store for you as a reward for all the things that you do. And this is one thing that we need to take heed to. Let's keep reading here. Verse number two. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, and see, this is why I kind of went into a little bit of a, of a defining of alms versus like tithes. Because this is not saying when you tithe, let not your left hand know what your right hand doeth. Because in order to give 10%, which is what a tithe is, you have, you're, you're kind of, your hands have to be in, in communication with each other to make sure you're giving the right amount to, to, to God for your tithe. That's different than alms. Alms is something that's just a complete free will offering that you're giving to someone. And he's saying, you know what? Don't even let your left hand know what your right hand do it. That's, that, and obviously, it's, it's using language in a colorful way to just explain no one needs to know what you're giving, how much you're giving, or anything like that. No, you know, your left hand doesn't even need to know if your right hand's the one giving it. Right? Just, just keep it that secret. Just put your hand in your pocket and... There you go, right? No one, no one needs to know about it. That's what this is explaining here. That thine alms may be in secret. That's the purpose of just, just keeping it on the down low, keeping it secret. And thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. So doing that is a good thing and God will give reward for that. But let's let God reward us in his time and his reward is going to be way better than anything that you would receive anyways. Now, this is a great time of year, I think, to learn this lesson because I want to apply this to gift giving. We're coming up on Christmas. Christmas is my favorite holiday. I love this time of year. I love, I love being able to hear songs. It, it gets harder and harder. Um, I don't really listen to, to the radio anymore, but you could still find a station every once in a while here and there that might play some Christmas music. Unfortunately, most of it's just a bunch of garbage, worldly music anyways. Uh, they used to play the hymns, but you're hard-pressed to find one these days. But you still have people, you know, putting up signs, talking about Jesus, and, and to me it's still a, a good, warm time of year. Unfortunately, what it's become is, is just completely commercialized, and it's become focused around this idea of having to give, buy gifts and, and give gifts to everyone. Now, I'm all for celebrating occasions by giving gifts. There's nothing wrong inherently with giving gifts to people. It's a nice thing. It's a good gesture. It's something good to do. You know, I don't have a problem with people giving gifts on birthdays or on anniversaries or on holidays, whatever. They're, all, they're, they're good things. But what, when it becomes a problem is when people start expecting gifts. Say, oh, Christmas is here. So... I better have, you know, this gift and this gift and this person and this person and this person better give to me. And if they don't give to me, I'm not giving to them. And people have this attitude and, uh, um, of just expecting something to come from. Look, you ought not, your heart is wicked if you, have, if you have an expectation that you deserve some kind of gift from anybody. And, and pay attention, kids, because it's not just adults, it's kids too. You know, you ought not to be thinking that you just that your parents owe it to you to buy you a present just because it's Christmas. Now, hopefully they explain it to you. I try to explain it to my kids that when we do give gifts, it's because we're celebrating a very important day where we're recognizing a day of, of, of the birth of Jesus Christ. And that is a very happy and joyous occasion. So we like to celebrate and show our love by offering gifts and giving gifts to, to those that we love because, because it's fun. But I'll tell you what, you ought, you ought never, ever, and, and watch out for this attitude, especially with you, know, you kids, of getting bitter 
or getting angry or getting upset because maybe you didn't get the gift that you really wanted to get or maybe you didn't get any gifts. Maybe someone didn't give you a present or a gift. Look, you ought not to be expecting it. If you don't have an expectation, you're going to be a much happier person in general. You're going to learn that, that no one owes you anything. Because when you are happy, when you don't have the expectation, anything that anybody gives you is a blessing and you ought to make you happy. And that's the way that, you know, I, I got this through my thick head a while ago, but I'll be honest with you, I don't ever expect and I never even suppose that anyone would ever, is ever going to get me a Christmas present. And it doesn't happen that often, but I do get them sometimes. And when I do get them, you know what? I'm happy about it. Why? Because I wasn't expecting anything. I'm not expecting anyone to do anything for me. So if anyone does get me anything, it's, joy it's great. And I don't care if it's something that I've been you know, thinking that I wanted to have for a while or not at all. It doesn't matter. Just the fact that people love you enough to give you a gift ought to be enough. And we need to be careful about that and be careful where our heart is. One, when you give the gifts. And two, when you receive gifts. Don't be worried about having to, to play this money. And this is another thing that drives me nuts. People play this money game. Oh, how much money do you think they spent on me? Oh, they spent this much money that we need to spend exactly this much money on them and stuff. It's like, that destroys the purpose of gift giving. Why don't you just give each other 100 bucks and be done with it? I mean, it's like you're just exchanging dollars. What, what's the point of that? The best gifts, if you really want to give gifts to people, is going to be from your heart. You think about that person. You think about them. Think about how you might want to be a blessing to them. And you know what? Sometimes, usually, actually, the best gifts don't cost a lot of money. They're not the most expensive gadgets and toys and things like that. But when someone puts a lot of effort and time in thinking about this person, they, and you can tell that they did with what they've given you or what they've made for you. You know, when people make gifts, make little blankets or, or knit things or whatever, things like that. To me, that means a lot. And it's not just some junk, but it's someone who's actually thought about you and took some of their time. It's a lot harder to take your time and invest into something that you're going to give to someone than it is to just whip out your wallet and just pay for something and say, here you go, here's a gift card or whatever. We need, we need to, to get back to a understanding what's the purpose of it all. Why are we even doing this? Uh, don't, we're not getting caught up in the, the commercialism of, of everything that you need to buy and all these gifts and you need to buy all these gifts and gift, 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 gift. And just if you don't do it, then you're going to feel guilty. You ought never to be f feeling guilty when it comes to gift giving. No one should be expecting gifts from anyone. Gifts are not merited. They're given out of love. And if you're expecting people to give you gifts this year, your heart's not right. Let's keep reading here in Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at another example besides giving alms, besides helping people out in that manner. He lists another, another illustration here, another example of, of something that we could do that we ought to be doing that's going to prevent us from being rewarded by God, and that's our prayer life. Of course, we ought to pray. That's something we ought to be doing on a regular basis. The Bible says pray without ceasing. We ought to, we ought to pray daily, multiple times a day. The Bible says in verse number five here, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So why do we go to God in prayer? We're asking God for things, right? That's why we pray. And he's saying here, do you want to be rewarded? Do you want me to answer your prayer? Do you want me to hear what you're doing? Then, then just pray to me in secret. Close, you know, go into your at home, go into your bedroom, go into your closet, close your closet door so no one else can hear you and you have your conversation with God. But what do people like to do? They like to pray. Now look, I'm not saying that any public prayer is just wrong and the Bible's not saying that either. 
It's obviously drawing a point here, and, and the contrast is with the hypocrites. He says, the hypocrites, they like to make long prayers because what it is, it's an opportunity for people to hear how eloquent you are, how well you talk to God, and you can wow people. This is what people think when they, when they make these prayers. And if you've been places before that have public prayers, sometimes you, you can, it's not that hard to, to sense who these people are. You go up to events up here, even the rodeo, other places, they'll have oftentimes still prayers before a lot of these events. Now, in our culture, it seems to be going away and going away because no one even wants to mention the name of Jesus Christ anymore because they're scared of it, because they're scared of the liberals, they're scared of people, who, the snowflakes are going to get offended and boycott them or whatever. But up here, things like that still happen. But it doesn't matter. I mean, you go, you go to someone's house for Thanksgiving, you go here, you go there, anywhere where you might hear a prayer, and every once in a while, you'll, 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 you'll see the person that this is referring to because they're talking to hear themselves talk. They're talking because they want everyone to see how great they are, how, how well they are with their words. And, oh, what a, you know, come up to them afterwards. What a lovely prayer. What a great prayer. And get all these accolades and people just, just um, gushing over them because of their prayers. This is obviously not the point. This is not what we want to do. So when, even if you're ever called to make a public prayer, and sometimes, oftentimes in church people do that. You know, the person who's running the service might say, hey, brother so-and-so, you please pray for us. If you're asked to pray in public, it's not your opportunity to like preach a sermon <laughs> in your prayer and just go over whatever, and all these things, oh man, I've been waiting to speak in front of the church. It's not the time for that. That's not what the prayer is for. We're, we're praying out of our heart to God. You're asking for things. You're asking for blessings. You're asking for, you know, whatever you might be asking for. That's just, and that's just one example, right? But but you know, you're giving your a prayer at, at Thanksgiving dinner or somewhere else or just on a for a regular meal, you know, let's do that appropriately. When we when we really need something from God, we're not gonna go out into the streets and make sure everyone can see we're praying and see how pious we are, see how holy we are, because we're praying to God. No, we're gonna do that secretly. God knows our heart, God knows the things that we need. He'll, he'll hear our prayers, but no one else needs to know how often we're praying and how often we're doing, you know, giving money to people and, and all the good deeds that we ought to be doing. No one else needs to know that. And the reason why is because when people know that, it tends to lift you up and then the, the focus goes away from God and from Jesus and from serving Him to you. Let's jump down here to verse number 16. We're going to see one more example in Matthew chapter 6 of something, again, something that you can do that's good and right, but that will earn you zero rewards because you're not doing it for the right reason. And that's fasting. Look at verse number 16. The Bible reads, Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Again, the this, this same exact uh, concept is being taught here, this time just in regards to, to fasting. And fasting is something that, that I believe that every Christian ought to do from time to time. And we ought to do that, to when, especially when we're, when we're praying fervently to God and we're, we're trying to get a hold of God and we're going to pray that, that God will hear us and, and We've got something very serious going on and we, and we end up fasting. It says, look, don't be like the hypocrites. The hypocrites let make sure everyone know they're fasting. Oh man, I'm so hungry. Oh, did you smell that food? Oh yeah, I'm fasting, right? Why? And, and, and not very many people fast these days. So for someone here, oh wow, he's fasting? Wow, he must be really spiritual. He must be really religious. He's taking this, you know, and, and that's the type of thing when you're, when you're just letting everyone know, oh man, I'm fasting. That is your reward. Okay, you, all of that work that you're putting forth into fasting and, and withholding, and because it, it's not easy. I mean, let's face it. You know, anyone who's fasted before, there's, there's times where it becomes more difficult. And the longer you fast, the more difficult it becomes. But it's something that we do to afflict ourselves 
and to, to get through to God, and we're not trying to let everybody know, hey, I'm fasting. I think there was one time I can remember where I actually had to tell someone that I was fasting, and I was already upset, and I was like, oh, man, I hope I didn't just blow it now because <laughs> I was at work, and, and I was in the office, and someone was trying to get me to eat something or whatever, you know, like, hey, do you want to have this? Or, you know, oh, no, thanks. Oh, really? No, you know, because normally they're like, yeah, Dave will eat whatever. You know? <laughs> someone brings in donuts or cookies or whatever, right? And, uh, and I had to refuse that and let them know. But, you know, obviously things like that will happen, but the... It, what Jesus is teaching here in Matthew 6 is that, you know, your heart not ought to be in a place where you're more concerned about what people think about you and that's why you're doing it, to just put on this show of being this righteous person or this, you know, this holy person, this church person, this religious person in, in their eyes, and that that's why you're doing it. Because if you do that, then you're not going to get anything from God. We ought to be doing this out of a sincere heart. Uh, turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah chapter 65. Another area we need to take heed that we're doing things for the right reasons. In addition to what we saw in Matthew chapter 6 with you know, giving alms, saying prayers, fasting. Um, another area is just going to church, right? attending church service. It's not a place to be seen of others or show people how holy you are. But it is a place where a lot of people want to come in and they say all the way, oh, hey, brother, hey, sister, you know, praise the Lord, amen, hallelujah, and then they go off and, and, and you know, live like the world for the rest of the week. Don't come in and do that. Be real. Now, it, hopefully, being real means you are, you are, you know, being somewhat spiritual, I suppose, or, or um, you know, caring about the things of the Bible, talking about the things of God because it's coming out of your heart. That's the place where we want to be. But don't put on some front or some show or be like these people that, that are above other people and have a holier-than-thou type of mentality in church where all you care about is looking like you're Mr. or Mrs. Spiritual and oh man, you, you know, you've got everything down. Look at, look at Isaiah 65. It's going to explain this a little bit better. Verse number two, the Bible says, I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. A people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face that sacrificeth in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick, which remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments, which eat swine's flesh and broth of abominable things is in their vessels, which say, Stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. These are a smoke in my nose, a fire in that burneth all the day. This is the way that God thinks about the people that have the holier-than-thou mentality. And this is where that phrase comes from. Literally, it comes from Isaiah 65, from this people that, that have this, like, and, and he says, look, these people provoke me to anger. They're doing all these things that are wrong. They're sacrificing in the gardens. They're, they're, they remain among the graves. They're eating swine's flesh, which that wasn't, um, that wasn't kosher for them to eat in the Old Testament. It wasn't, what, it wasn't uh, something that was allowed for them to eat. They had dietary restrictions under the Mosaic law during this time frame, yet they were doing it anyways, and they were, they were doing all of these things that were abominable to God, and then they had the audacity to have this attitude, oh, stand by thyself. Don't, don't come near to me because I'm holier than you. I don't, want, I don't want your wickedness and your sin to rub off on me because I'm so holy. And God sees that from heaven, and it makes him really, really, really angry. Now, this is the way that the Pharisees acted. They loved the greetings in the marketplaces. They loved the seats at the uppermost room at their feasts. They loved the attention. They loved people coming to them and calling them rabbi, father, oh, you're so smart, oh, you know everything, and getting all this glory and attention and, and people looking on them, oh, Mr. Holy Man. 
And God knew them. God knew their hypocrisy. God knew how wicked they were. They're telling people to do things, and they won't even lift up one finger to do the things that they're telling other people to do. Beware of that. Watch out for that. And, and, and try not to allow yourself to get into this mentality. All of these things that we're looking at, you know, there's a reason why it says to take heed. Because you can be a believer and, and sin in any one of these ways. Why? Because it feels good to the flesh to have people like you. To have people think good things about you. Now look, I want people to think good things about me. I think everybody does. It does feel good, but we need to make sure that we are sincere and have integrity to God, that we're not placing our feelings and how people think about us above Him and above how we ought to think about Him and what's the purpose for doing things. Because if you just want to feel good, there's so many people out there these days, it's like, it's like a plague with social media. People are vying for attention and trying to get all these likes and everything else, and, and you know what? This type of thing can happen even within churches, even among believers, people who, who really love God. They, they, you know, they live, may, maybe they don't live around people, and it's even harder that, that share the same beliefs that they do, and they just want to get a lot of attention from people on the Internet, so they just keep on posting, oh, man, I got 10 people saved today. Oh, I got 20 people saved, you know, and just continually trying to get people to, to, to like their status and share their stuff. And, and there's this, this sense of people that really, um, you know, they, they want to keep having that. But then it, it turns out to be all the good things that they're doing, they just have to brag and show everyone else about it. Watch out for that. Look, it happens to people. I see it. I see it almost right any time I turn on the Internet. It's there. It exists. Don't lose your rewards of doing good things, of doing the things you're supposed to be doing just because you want attention from people. And, and really make sure you're watching out from having this, this holier-than-thou type of an attitude with anybody. Nobody wants to hear that. No one wants to see that. Um, and just because you might have a little bit more knowledge than someone or whatever doesn't give you the right to just think that you're all that and, and be walking around with a puffed up head on your shoulders because you think you're, you know everything about scripture or whatever and you've got it all together. No, you don't. No one's got it all together. Turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. Doing things for the right reasons. And doing things the right way. So this is, this is an example. You know, coming to church, we don't, want, we don't just come to church so that people can see us and see, oh yeah, you know, brother so-and-so is coming to church all the time and just to try to, to get people to, to make them think that you're, that you're really holy or, or uh, you know, really serving God a lot. You ought to just be here because you do want to serve God and that's it. And you don't care what other people think. And, and hopefully you're just here to be around other like-minded believers that love God and want to and wanna serve Him the same way. We see another example here, though, in, in Mark 11, verse number 15, because church is also not about buying or selling or making merchandise of people. And Jesus was very serious about this. Verse number 15, Mark 11, the Bible reads, And they come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers, and the seats of them that sold doves, and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And, you know, come, come to church for the right reason. Jesus Christ threw out these people. Now, they were buying and selling things that pertained to the service of the Lord. So the things that they were selling, if you will, you could call them Christian things, right? It would be like having a Christian bookstore in the church or whatever, right? Things that, that would go along with serving the Lord, except that's not the right place to be doing your business. It's not supposed to be in the house of the Lord. And that's why we don't sell anything here at church. We give everything away for free. But not only that, 
you know, we can also take away from this example is, you know, don't come in trying to sell to people with your own personal business. Just because you could say, you know, it's not just talking about us, you know, selling DVDs or selling materials or resources here and just like as a church. It also goes for any individual. No individual should be buying or selling within church, within God's house, within the temple. Because that's not what the purpose is at all. We're not here to, to make money or, or sell things or anything like that. You don't use church people to, to market to, to, to sell your, your junk to, or whatever. That's not what we're here for. And don't think you're going to come in and make merchandise of the people at church. It's going to make God really, really angry. Uh, turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Actually, you know what? Just go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over this. Second Corinthians chapter 10. We we'll start reading in verse number 11. The Bible reads, Let such an one think this, that such as we are in word, by letters, when we are absent, such will we be also indeed when we are present. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. Again, another example here of things you can be doing the right things to serve God, but your heart can be in the wrong place and cause all kinds of problems. And what the people were doing here, what, what Paul is making mention of is saying, you know, let's, let's not be the type of person that's just comparing ourselves with other people in the church. And you're comparing your own spirituality and your own work for God. And, and everything you're doing, you're in comparison with, with oh, brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, what are they doing? And, and having almost like this, this competition or thinking, oh, well, I'm, I'm more spiritual than this person, so I'm really good and they're not good. And, and this, this idea of kind of lifting yourself up or propping yourself up based on everybody else. Well, you know what? Everyone else is not your standard. That's not who God wants you comparing yourself to. Because if you're in a group of people and everybody's wicked... You're, you, it's, not, it's not that hard to be a little bit more spiritual than everybody else. And look, this is important because people look to others all the time as their examples of who's doing what. Well, well you know, this person only comes to church once a week and I come twice a week, so I'm, I'm doing really good. I'm, you know, it's like, no, why don't you compare yourself just to Scripture? Why, why don't you compare yourself to, to God's standards and worry about that and not care about what everyone else is doing. Look, everyone else may be doing great. They may not be doing great, but I'm going to please the Lord. And I'm not going to think I'm something or boast myself of saying, ha, 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 I've memorized more scripture. I've put in more soul winning hours. I've you know, because you might put in two hours of soul winning and that's more than everyone else in your church. But try going to another church that's a lot more on fire and they're putting in eight hours or 10 hours a week, all of a sudden your two hours isn't that hot anymore. But see, even that is foolish just to get caught up in worrying about what is everyone else doing. Worry about what God has for you to do. And don't compare yourself among yourselves and commend themselves. It says, verse 12, For we dare not make ourselves the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. But we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure as though we reach not unto you. For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things without our measure, that is, 
of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. Now, what, before I keep reading here, one of the things he's doing is, you know, they reached far and wide with preaching the gospel, but he said, we're making very clear that we're not speaking of things that other people have done and kind of riding on the coattails of other people's work. He said, no, we're doing our own work and anything that we're going to talk about is stuff that we actually have done. You know, I'm not going to, and, and, you know, and think about this, when you, when you go to a good church, don't ride on the coattails of what the pastor's doing and just brag to everyone, oh yeah, my pastor, he, he does this much or our church does this much. Well, how much are you doing? How much are you doing? That's what you need to worry about. I mean, don't, don't worry about whatever, you know, anyone else. Worry about what you're doing for God. Verse 16, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. And that, and that last phrase there, that last verse is very important because if you commend yourself, if you're giving yourself commendations and saying how great you are, that doesn't mean anything. It's, that's, that's not where the true honor comes from. You can't take honor on yourself and give yourself honor. You need to do the work and someone else provides the honor for you. That's what he says, but whom the Lord commendeth. So when God sees your work, when God sees you give alms, when God sees you fast, when God hears you pray, when, when all of these things are done here, you know what? Then God is going to commend you. God will lift you up. You abase yourself. You do the things. You put your face down. You do your work. You work hard. You don't worry about what other people think. And you know what? In the end, God will be the one to lift you up. He'll be the one to provide the commendation to be commending you, and no one else needs to. And that's when you get your true rewards. And anyone that's going to glory or brag, that's glory in the Lord. It's glory in God. We don't need the glory of our own work. We don't need the glory in anyone else's work. Let's just glory in the Lord. And this is an error. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 5. It's the last place I'll have you turn. But again, I think this, the online world is the easiest place to fall into that trap that we need to take heed to and, and beware of, of just all the bragging that, that goes on, especially when it comes to doing the work of soul winning. Or even having a pompous attitude towards others that may not have that much knowledge. It might be a newer Christian or whatever, and people just want to spout off the mouth and... and make themselves sound so knowledgeable and have no humility at all. <clears throat> now, I, I do think there is a level of, of information to share when, peop when good things are being done and works are happening in churches and stuff uh, that can provide encouragement to those who, you know, aren't part of the group necessarily, but they want, you know, they, they get motivated by, by seeing, oh, wow, there's, there's this soul winning you know, event going on here, and, and they're driving over to this community and winning souls here. That's great. And it, it is encouraging and can be edifying, but we need, you, know, you need to check your heart and make sure that you're not just starting to post every single salvation up there because you want people to see how much, you're, how much soul winning you're doing or whatever, right? And that's... That's going to be something that, that you can deal with between you and God and how your heart is on, on whether or not that's the case for you. But just, just take heed and watch out for that because we ought to be doing things for the right reason. You know, if, you're, if you're going on doors and every time you, you, know, you win someone Christ something, you're automatically just getting out your phone and just making sure everyone has to know, watch out for that. 1 Peter chapter 5, so it's the last uh, topic we're going to hit when it comes to doing things for the right reasons. Make sure that everything we do is, is done in the right spirit, in the right heart, for the right reasons. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 1, the Bible reads, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. 
Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. And again, another example here. We're going to read the rest of that in a minute, but Peter is, is exhorting other pastors, other elders, other bishops. And he's explaining them, saying, hey, look, you need to feed the flock of God. You need to be teaching them. You need to be instructing them out of God's word. You need to give that to them. That's part of your job. He says, taking the oversight. I mean, you're taking on that burden and that responsibility, not by constraint, not because you have to, but because you want to willingly. It's something that you want to do. It's something that you want to help these people out. It's not just like, oh man, I have to do this. You know, I pray to God, I never get to the point where I just feel like I have to pastor. Or I have, you know, like I have to do this. Even though I do feel like it's, you know, I mean, I, taking on the role and to begin with is, 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 you know, there's some requirements I think that go along with that. But this isn't the type of job that you, you know, you know, a lot of people have jobs where you go to work and you feel like, I can't wait to get out of here. You don't like what you're doing. Every day is just kind of dreadful and, and it's, just, it's just not fun at all. That's not the way that, that pastoring should be at all. That's what he's saying here. He's like, you know, you should be doing this willingly and you should actually care about the people and care about teaching and everything else. And then he says, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. He said, you're not doing this just for money. There's, there's plenty of false prophets out there right now that all they care about is getting money. All they care about is getting a bigger paycheck. That's why they don't ever preach on sin, because the less you preach on things that offend people, the more people you could have to fill up your pews and the more money you could have come in. And when uh, you have an elder who is who is greedy of filthy lucre or just money, right? Who's greedy of this dirty money, uh, that's going to be a problem. You can't, you can't be greedy. You need to be of a ready mind. And then verse 3 says, Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And that goes to the way that a pastor ought to lead. Look, desiring the office of a bishop is a good work. But obviously there are wrong ways and wrong things of doing this and wrong motivations to have to where even being a bishop if you're, if, you're, if you're not doing things right and if your motivation isn't right, it's going to profit you nothing. It's going to profit people nothing. Just, I mean, even in Matthew 7, there's going to be people who, uh, who think that they're, they're going to heaven based on all their good works and it's going to profit them nothing. Why? Because they didn't have faith. But um, he says here, it's, you, the, the pastor's not supposed to be lords. Like a lord meaning telling everybody what to do. Like, I have a commandment for you and for you and for you and for you and this is, what, this is the way things are going to be done and you have to do all this work and, and, and having that type of authority in the sense where you're just lording over people and telling everyone what to do with their lives and micromanaging their details and everything else. That's not the job that, that God has defined here for the, the elder to have. But rather what it is, it's, one, it's a leader that leads by example. He's a leader that says, hey, I want, everyone, I want everyone in this church to go soul winning. I want, I want everyone in this church to go soul winning every single week. Now go out and do it. No, that's not the right way to lead. The right way is, come with me. I'm going out soul winning multiple times this week. Come out with me. We're going to go out and knock some doors. You teach, hey, it's important, not lording over you, but hey, I'm going to be an example. Come on, let's do this. And, and, that, and you could use that, apply that to, to any example, right? I mean, whether it be your Bible reading. That's why this, earlier this year, we did a whole series of challenges, which guess what? We're going to be doing that again next year. And every challenge, everything I ask of the church, you know what I'm doing? I'm participating in it because that's my job. Because I want to be an example. I want to be an example to the flock, as the Bible says. I'm not going to ask you to do things. I'm not going to lord over you and tell all of you to do all this stuff and to, and, and to serve God this way, and I'm not going to lift my finger and do any of it. No, I'm going to do all of it. I'm going to show that it can be done. 
Because often, too often times, people have a tendency to think that, oh, there's just too much. I don't know how you can go so, I don't know how I can read my Bible. I don't know how I can do this Bible. I don't know how I can do, you know, this prayer. I mean, there's just not enough time for this. Really? I can show you how it's done. We could compare our, our schedules on, on how busy you are. The problem usually isn't that you don't have the time. The problem usually is that you don't have the right priorities. That's what it boils down to. The problem is that your heart's not in it. Your spirit may be willing, but, but the flesh is weak. And, and we need to, to make the decisions that, you know what, it may be difficult to get to church three times a week. For some people lately, it seems to be too difficult to get to church once a week. Verse number four says, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Then that's for the elders that, that are the ensamples, that are not lording, that are doing things with the right heart. And when you do things right, when your heart's in it, God's going God's to gonna reward you for that. Just like everything we saw in Matthew 6, we need to take heed to these things. We need to take heed that we're doing what's right and take heed that our heart is right and that we're not using or abusing our responsibilities, not comparing ourselves with everyone else. Let's just focus on what God has for us to do and let's do what's right. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for uh, these teachings that we get from your word. God, it's a simple message tonight. I pray that you would please help us. You know our hearts. God, you know my heart. You know everyone's heart here tonight. Lord, help us not to put on some big front or some big show to try to impress people Lord, um, that is not the right reason at all. Help us just to serve you humbly and meekly. And God, we want all the glory and credit and honor to go to you, to your name, and that whatever we can offer, dear Lord, we're, we'll, we'll do so thankfully. Pray that you would please just uh, work with the, within the spirit of this church and help us all to find the drive and the motivation to do more and to, and to get right, dear Lord, and to, to uh, serve you with, with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.